Folks, we'll begin, um, and I'd like to uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather here today, the Gadigal clan of the Eora Nation. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which the Macquarie University main campus stands, the Wallamagal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture the land since time immemorial. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future, and celebrate First Nations people's ongoing connections to the lands and waters about which the panel will speak this evening. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today, whether in the room or via Zoom. I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for coming, um, each of you. Um, a particular welcome to those students of mine, um, whether criminal justice or international law, or perhaps Anna in the corner there, who's fortunate or unfortunate enough to study both subjects under my tutelage this semester. Um, I'd like to thank Justice Preston for giving him his time to chair the panel. I'd like to thank each of our panelists for their time this evening. I'd also like to thank our cell volunteers, Nina, Thomas, who admitted you downstairs, I believe, um, maybe one of the softer touch security guards you might come across in your time, um, and uh, Anna, who I've already uh, mentioned. I'd also like to thank the staff at the Macquarie University City Campus, particularly Ankit, as well as uh, Pashka Anand, who's assisted with putting together this panel. Um, just a brief background on CELL and the Law and Nature Dialogues, um, of which this evening's panel forms part. Um, established in 1983, CELL, or the Centre for Environmental Law, um, is Australia's oldest continually functioning environmental law centre. Um, and as for the Law and Nature Dialogue, this was established in uh, 2020, slightly different format. Um, formerly a um, paper panel presentation, a paper presentation type format, we've moved to a panel discussion, dialogue. Um, and I'd like to thank Paul Govin for his role uh, as co-designer um, in uh, revamping this series. As for the format for uh, the evening, uh, the session was due to begin at six, um, but it started a little after. Uh, in any event, um, it will run until uh, 7 p.m. In the, in the dialogue format and then questions and answers will be welcomed from the floor um, both virtually and in person. I'm being told that the sound box is very cool. I'm not sure there's much I can do about that. Maybe I can try. Is that any better? Better with this mic? Oh, yes, yes, great. Good. In that case, that's good because we're planning on using this one. Anyway, okay, right, I'll introduce um, now the, the, the chair and the panelists, and then I'll hand over, you're here to listen to me anyway. Uh, Justice Preston is the Chief Judge of the Land and Environment Court of New South Wales. Um, prior to being appointed in November 2005, he was a senior counsel practicing primarily in New South Wales in environmental planning, administrative and property law. He's lectured in postgraduate environmental law for over 30 years. He's the author of Australia's first book on environmental litigation, and 153 articles, book chapters, and reviews on environmental law, administrative law, and criminal law. He holds numerous editorial positions in environmental law publications, has been involved with a number of international environmental consultants, capacity building programs, including for judiciaries throughout Asia, Africa, and the European Union. He's an official member of the Judicial Commission of New South Wales, fellow of the Australian Academy of Law, the Royal Society of New South Wales, and an honorary fellow of the Environment Institute of Australia and New Zealand. Uh, he's a member of various international environmental law committees and advisory boards. He's currently a visiting professor at my alma mater at Durham University in the UK, no less, an adjunct professor at three Australian universities, and a former visiting fellow at Corpus Christi College and Morton College at Oxford University in England. Um, I can proceed actually. Um, so Dr. Rachel Killeen, that's just as present right, is a senior lecturer at Sydney Law School, member of the Sydney Institute of Criminology, Sydney Southeast Asia Centre, and the Sydney Environment Institute. Before joining Sydney Law School, she was a senior lecturer at Queen's University, Belfast School of Law. Dr. Killeen's research centres and uh, responses to violence with a focus on transitional justice, victims' rights sexual and gender-based violence, and harms perpetrated against the natural. 
Dr. Marie Faruqi is the Green Senator for New South Wales and the Deputy Leader of the Australian Greens. She's a civil and environmental engineer, a lifelong activist for social and environmental justice. In 2013, she joined the New South Wales State Parliament, becoming the first Muslim woman to sit in an Australian parliament. In August 2018, she became Australia's first Muslim senator. Senator Faruqi's portfolios include anti-racism, international aid and global justice, education and animal welfare. And last but by no means least, Professor Anne Felina is co-chair of Indigenous Studies at the Lundu Institute, University of Notre Dame, Australia, and chair of Motawara Fitzroy River Council. She is a Kimberley Nyiginawara Indigenous woman, an active community leader, human and earth rights advocate, and filmmaker. A holder of multiple degrees in various international activities, Professor Felina is also the Murray Darling Basin the inaugural First Nations appointment to its Independent Advisory Committee on Social economic and environmental sciences. Um, I'm still being told that the sound quality is poor, and I'll try and tweak that from here, but I'll hand over to Justice Preston to continue. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just say a few things to set the, the scene, and then each of the uh, speakers will speak for a uh, short period of time, uh, and then we can open up some, some questions from me, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So let's start with what we mean by uh, ecocide. So the uh, international uh, panel, ecocide panel for the legal definition of ecocide defined it in this way. So it's unlawful for want of acts. First part, that's the actus reus. And the mens rea comes. Committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of A, severe, and then B, either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. So we can see there that the actus reus is the unlawful or wanted acts. The mens rea component is knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of those acts causing the specified harm to the environment. Now, some of those terms of both the actus reus and the mens rea components are defined. So for actus reus, they uh, do not define what is meant by unlawful, but they do define what is meant by wanton. And that means with reckless disregard for damage, which would be clearly excessive in relation to the social and economic benefits anticipated, something we might uh, encounter in the discussion, is note the anthropocentric nature of that definition. So it's it's wanton is the reckless disregard for damage, which means clearly excessive in relation to social and economic benefits uh, anticipated. So in mens rea, that there are uh, four terms defined: severe, widespread, long-term, and environment. Now they are wide enough to include not only harm to humans but also to the non-human environment. So there are at least these uh, five topics that I think we will uh, start to explore uh, in various ways. The first is that very definition of what we mean by ecocide. So what is the conduct that we want to define as being ecocide? The second is question about criminalization of that conduct. And there's really two questions here. One is, does the conduct of ecocide, however we define it, need to be a separate crime? Or are the existing crimes in relation to the environment sufficient to criminalize conduct which we define? So that's one question. The next is, if we decide that it should be a separate crime, we need to decide at what level in the legal system we're going to criminalize it. Does it need to be an international crime? Now, of course, at the moment, that's the push to make it an international crime. But can we also make it a domestic crime? And you can have, of course, an international crime, which can also be a, a, a domestic crime. But we need to think about that. And in what order? Do we need to wait until we can make it a crime at international level? Or could we, in each nation state, 
progress in it immediately to make it a crime in the nation state, while still pursuing the objective of making it a crime internationally. The third set of questions determines the institutions that are going to hear and decide prosecutions for the crime of ecocide. And we need to think of what institutions internationally and what institutions domestically. And the suggestion is that the uh, crime, the international crime, be dealt with by the International Criminal Court. But of course, the International Criminal Court has got its difficulties, one of which is many of the major players in the world do not recognize its jurisdiction. And they might be nation states that commit the ecocide. So if we put all our eggs in the basket of International Criminal Court, are we uh, making it ineffective? Or should we have some other institution? Should we set up an institution? Or should we pursue it at domestic courts? The fourth set of questions concerns the victims of ecocide. And we need to decide who are the victims. And ordinarily, the victims of a crime will come from the definition of the crime. As we've seen, there's some components there which are very human-centric, although there are some components that uh, in the definition which takes into account non-human uh, environment. So we need to decide uh, those questions. And they uh, can include, obviously, humans. Then we can look at uh, categories um, or, uh, of the human species um, because ecocide might disproportionately affect certain individuals, groups, communities uh, more than it does others, the same way that that's the issue with environmental justice. Um, and we need to think about uh, the victims as being non-human nature. The final and my fifth um, category of questions that we need to address is sentencing and reparation for the crime. It's all very well prosecuting and finding uh, people uh, guilty of the crime, but what are we going to do about it? What are the sanctions? And if you think immediately without going into it, the sanctions for crimes such as genocide do not include a lot of reparation. So, yet the crime of ecocide, by definition, it is a it is a crime against the environment. So, are we going to leave those victims of the environment uh, without any remedy? So, we need to think about what are the uh, sanctions uh, and uh, for uh, that crime. So the each of the four speakers that we have will look at different aspects. I'm not going to say they're going to cover all of those five questions, but you'll see, and that's why I wanted to sort of set this up, that that's a framework within which we can start to think about uh, this um, crime of uh, ecocide. So with that, um, we'll start with our first, and that is uh, uh, Senator Maureen Faruqi. I'm very loud, so I don't know if people can hear me without a mic. Or do oh, sorry, okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I too would like to start by acknowledging the sovereign owners of the lands that we gathered off, the Gadigal people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. No matter where we are in this country, we are on stolen land. Sovereignty was never ceded. This is, always was and always will be by um, Aboriginal land. And as we are talking about the environment, I do also want to acknowledge that two centuries of colonialism have undone millennia of management and care for country that First Nations people have been doing for such a long time. And for me, there can be no climate justice or environmental justice without First Nations justice, and there can be no First Nations justice without racial justice. So I think we need to keep that in the context when we talk about environmental destruction, ecocide, and what it means, who's the criminal, um, who has the crime been perpetrated against, and what preparations uh, might you know, we impose. I'm no lawyer, so I apologize for that. Um, as you heard, I'm a civil and environmental engineer. I spent about 25 years of my life 
working in that field, um, including as an academic in sustainability. Uh, so I just wanted to take you with a little bit of journey of how my views on environment protection formed um, and where I am now with what we need to do to protect our nature. Uh, I grew up in Pakistan and I was very lucky to have um, a father who was very kind of close to nature. We would spend every summer in the foothills of the Himalaya, so Chagori Mountain, which is K2, and that's where my love uh, for, for nature really developed. And it really is heartbreaking for me to see now what's happening over there, because I spent my childhood amongst glaciers which are melting now at such a rapid pace and causing devastation floods. And you might remember a couple of years ago the climate induced flooding that has affected millions upon millions of people in Pakistan. I went there in July and they still have no more to go and they're still out on, on the streets with no shelter, no food or any other Um so kind of that's my childhood. But I moved to Australia in 1992. And 1992 was the year of the year of summit. And there was such a huge buzz in Australia about how things were going to change now. Um, because, you know, sustainable development was the buzzword. Uh, and we had those uh, ecologically sustainable development principles. Uh, and I started my master's in environmental engineering um, at that very time. Um, and was so kind of excited about the changes that we would make. Um, and um, I remember at that time, uh, our teacher telling us that the, the word ecological was actually a push by Australian governments so that we would make sure that nature would have primacy. And maybe that's the question to correct me if I'm wrong there. But basically, the reason was that nature would have primacy over other types of development. And I kind of look back and see how far away we have come from being leaders at that time in environmental management and protection to this time where you know we are in the middle of the climate crisis um, and you all know what's happening down here. Um, but you know when I joined New South Wales Parliament I took kind of all my knowledge and my love for the environment and my open heart and open mind wanting to change things. Um, but again what I saw governments doing this links to ecocide in a way that you know we're looking at ecocide as I think a big radical change if we agree that that's what should, should happen. We are in, in the context in this country where our environmental laws, some good, some not so good, still allow so much destruction to happen. You know, there's indiscriminate logging of our native forests, right? When I was in New South Wales Parliament, I had the environment portfolio, and um, you might remember the so called biodiversity laws were introduced and passed in 2017. <clears throat> Basically, they're land clearing laws. Um, and I remember putting government through a lot of pain. I got them to sit till 4 a.m. in the morning, trying to pass 65 amendments to that bill to try and make it better. None of them passed, sadly. And now we're bearing the consequences. Um, and we know that reports just this year tell us how much land clearing of native vegetation has happened in the last four years. I think it's 95,000 hectares every year. Uh, which is huge. I think it's something like 650 football fields a day, a day, um, because of those really lax laws. And you know, hopefully we can talk more about um, the terrible laws that we have and how we need to change them. Um, but I did, um, I wrote a book a couple of um, years ago and I dedicated a whole chapter to the environment and environmentalism. So I just thought I'd read just a couple of pages from that for you to get an idea of where I sit on either side and rights of nature um, and uh, how I view the environment, where on the spectrum um, I fit on the environmental spe spectrum. So when people hear about my environmental journey and professional career in sustainability, they nod knowingly and say, ah, now I understand why you joined the Greens. I love that my party is seen as synonymous with environmental care. But it is frustrating that we are pigeonholed as a single issue party that only cares about one thing, the environment. That's not how I see it. And I've developed that, that view over time. I've seen, I see the environment as so much more than one thing. I don't see social and environmental problems as discrete. 
When you live with nature, you start to see it as a system with many interacting parts, which cannot be detached. The unprecedented fires, floods, and droughts unfolding across the world as a result of human-induced global warming, and the devastated communities and environments left in their way shows just how inseparable anthropogenic and ecological processes are. Every aspect of our lives affects our environment, and every aspect of the environment affects our lives. The reality is that the environment is at the beginning and end of everything. That's why philosophies that elevate the rights of nature resonate with me. I want to protect the environment for its intrinsic value, not just for what it can give us. Nature was here long before we arrived, so we must learn to live as a part of nature, not apart from it. By contrast, the very human-centric Western worldview holds that we humans have a right to nature. It is galling to me that human exertion of a superiority of the environment makes it a mere means to satisfy our ends. Where I see magnificent trees to be hugged and protected for glossy black cockatoos and powerful owls, developers see high-rise buildings flashing with dollar signs. Where I see beautiful bush resplendent with koalas, kangaroos, eastern water dragons, and gray-headed blind foxes, greedy corporations see logging and mining profits. Where I see opportunities to connect with nature, hear the bird songs, and enjoy the sounds of the rainforest, governments beholden to vested interests, see the cash flowing from political donations. But the value of nature cannot be monetized. It must be taken beyond the limits of economics and into the spheres of justice and morality. And I think that's where this idea of ecocide and rights of nature fits. The environment is resilient, but we've stretched it beyond its limits. Nature has had enough. It is biting back, and its wrath is impacting humans, humanity indelibly. Shouldn't protecting nature then be the ultimate act of selfishness? It seems counterintuitive to have a human-centric approach that harms people. After all, if our well-being, indeed our survival, depends on the purity of the air we breathe, the availability and quality of the water we drink, and the health of the soils which grow the food we eat, shouldn't we be nourishing the environment, not killing it? The disconnect between our actions and their consequences seems illogical until you figure out whom the actions are benefiting, and who is bearing consequences. It is the rich and powerful, and mainly white people, who profit from the abuse of the environment, while poor people and the people of color suffer disproportionately. Unjustly, those facing the first and worst impacts of environmental degradation did not contribute substantially to the problem either. To make the injustice worse, those who reap the benefits from nature's destruction also have the means to shield themselves from the effects of their handiwork. As the crisis worsens, it is creating a climate and environmental apartheid, where the privileged can afford to adapt while the marginalized are left to contend with its burdens. So I might finish there, and hopefully that gives you a little bit of a picture of where I come from when I think about environmental protection, ecocide, and rights of nature. Thank you. Hello. So uh, I am a lawyer, and I also apologize for that. <laughs> um, my pathway to ecocide comes from the other side. So I started off as and continue to be an international criminal law researcher. Uh, my work started in Cambodia, and that was already the start of my interest in environmental harm, because as you may know, if you are already interested in ecocide, uh, the bombing of Cambodia is the first incidence of an atrocity that was uh, framed in this way following uh, the use of Agent Orange in Cambodia and Vietnam and Laos. 
So my research, although not concerned with environmental harm at the start, it was concerned with the, the crimes of the Khmer Rouge regime against the Cambodian population, has always been interested in who we understand to be a victim, how we frame victimhood and recognize victimhood, and what rights flow from that recognition. So as it became, as we all have more conscious of the environmental crises that we are facing on numerous fronts, it made sense to me to turn to the tools that I know best. And so the tools that I know best are international criminal law and to consider where is there space for a broader recognition of victimhood in this regime? And where might there be space for other ways of thinking about harm? So as it stands, and as Judge Preston alluded to, international criminal law is profoundly anthropocentric as it currently stands. You know, it focuses on crimes perpetrated against people and crimes perpetrated against people's property predominantly. So although we have a war crime that relates to environmental destruction, it in itself is, is largely unworkable as a practical crime. So what does that mean for the recognition of victimhood and repair? It means that those who suffer a result of large scale environmental atrocities don't so easily see their victimhood recognized in this framework. And when it comes to making repair, even for the crimes that are currently captured by international criminal law, that repair is grounded in human harm and harm against property. So, on the understanding of those limitations, I started to explore how we might expand, like how we might stretch what we have. When you face an environmental crisis on the scale that we currently do, I think we have to use all tools at our disposal, even those that might not seem the most impactful. And we can definitely have a conversation about how impactful the ICC is in particular. Um, so I started to think about, well, we have these tools of reparation, for example, and many of those offer pathways to responding to environmental harm if we, we conceived of it in that way. So the ICC, the International Criminal Court, allows for restitution that might involve returning victims to the place that they were before the harm occurred. It allows uh, compensation to be given. It involves uh, measures of rehabilitation, guarantees of non-recurrence. How might we use those tools to better address environmental harm? And then moving beyond that, how might we reframe victimhood to better recognize environmental harm? And so the work that I'm doing just now with Libby, who's also here, to my student, um, explores how we might expand the notion of victimhood beyond the human. Now, this would not sit easily if the ICC were our proposed forum. The ICC defines a victim as a natural person or a specific category of organizations and institutions. But what if we did think more broadly? What if a victim was a natural entity? What if a victim was an ecosystem? There are already models for that type of recognition. Judge Preston has written about them. We can see it in Colombia in the work of HEP, they recognizing the territories of indigenous people as victims of the conflict. We can see it in the growth of rights of nature movements around the world. We have tools to recognize nature as a victim of harm. So for me, what's interesting about ecocide is the recognition and the repair that might flow from that and how we might think profoundly differently about how we conceptualize harm. I guess the other thing I want to say is that despite having ended up in this ecocide space, I remain profoundly skeptical about its ability to transform uh, in any meaningful way, particularly if we pursue the ICC as the appropriate forum. The ICC is resource stretched. It can barely cope with the wide range of atrocities happening around the world as it stands. It's selective in its focus. As Judge Preston alluded to, many powerful states are not privy, um, privy are not par party to its uh, Rome statute. And yeah, it has a very small case uh, file so far. So I suppose I remain skeptical I think we need to turn to other legal tools in addition. I find rights of nature, for example, potentially to be a more hopeful framing. But as I say, for me, in the face of this scale of challenge, we have to think about every possible avenue to pursuing accountability. Um, and I guess that's why it's important to be part of dialogues like this. I'll stop there.
John, deeply sorry. I hope she, she will be speaking now. I didn't introduce you earlier. I think I was caught up. It's trying to get the sound to be better. And I want to hold the mic a little further from my mouth. Dr. Michelle Maloney will speak next. She's uh, online. She's pinned. Zoom. Um, Dr. Michelle Maloney is co-founder and national convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, AELA, and the director of Future Dreaming and the New Economy Network Australia, NENA. ALA works to increase the understanding and implementation of Earth-centered governance, and as part of this transdisciplinary work, it supports Stop Ecocide International and hosts a working group exploring elements of ecocide law in Australia. Michelle holds a Bachelor of Arts political science and history, and laws honours from the Australian National University, a PhD in Griffith University. Thank you. Can you actually hear me? Yes, really. Oh, good. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the organisers. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. and Professor Anne Polina, um, a wonderful Indigenous elder, and I'm looking forward to her talk today. I'd also like to acknowledge Judge Preston and our other speakers. Um, I'm speaking to you today from the very beautiful part of Southeast Queensland, that is the traditional lands of the Cubby Cubby people. And I'd also, as everyone else has, um, acknowledge that always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you for inviting me to make some comments um, about ecocide laws. Um, <clears throat> I guess the what I'd like to share is a little bit of the nuts and bolts information um, that we've been looking at through a working group that has formed with um, green criminologist, Professor Rob White, uh, myself, a number of really wonderful students, um, Dr. Gwyn McCarrick, who's now um, part of Griffith University. Um, and we've got a small working group that has held a number of events each year, looking at what ecocide is all about and exploring, I think really picking up on from what Rachel said, um, the practicalities of ecocide. I'm also a little skeptical about the capacity of nation states to create something that would then impose even more um, harsh penalties on their citizens and others uh, at this time. I'm seeing certain reluctance in the Australian governments to take on any additional responsibilities, let alone the extra or the existing uh, responsibilities that they have. So yeah, it's, um, it's something that I'm interested in because as Rachel said, we have so many different issues, so many different problems. We really need to use all of the tools in the toolbox and then some, we need to be creative. Um, but I might just, for those who perhaps are a bit newer to the ecocide um, world, just give you um, a three minute potted history of where these ideas have come from, the definitions and why the current definition um, is being discussed in a more rigorous way and what is possible in Australian law. So I'll do that as quickly as I can. So, so first of all, um, the concept of ecocide um, was actually flagged in public discussions during the Vietnam War due to the horrors of Agent Orange. Um, from the 1970s through the 1990s, it was discussed by different international lawyers in the International Law Commission. And in 1996, drafts of the Rome Statute actually included the crime of ecocide, but it was dropped by the ILC in 96. Polly Higgins, the late Polly Higgins, wonderful woman, um, she became quite well known for talking about and raising the profile of the idea of ecocide. Uh, and in 2010, she presented to the United Nations Law Commission um, a pretty straightforward definition of ecocide, and it was about the extensive loss, damage, or destruction of ecosystems in a given territory, such that peaceful enjoyment for the of the inhabitants um, would be severely diminished. Um, probably useful for some folks who don't know that um, ecocide laws actually already exist, and I think it's about might be up to around 10 nation states legal systems today. Many of them are in the provinces, the former provinces of the USSR, which are now their own nation states like um, Tajikistan, Georgia, Belarus, Ukraine, places where they haven't actually had the capacity to enforce them. Um, but I might come back to that idea of what can happen in a national legal system. And again, for those who don't know, the current definition that people are talking about it's probably important to remember, it's not in law yet. There is no law of ecocide at the international level. Um, in November 2020, the Stop Ecocide Foundation convened what they called the Independent Expert Panel for the Legal Definition of Ecocide. 
So that's where they were trying to grapple with what a practical and effective definition of the crime of ecocide could look like, sitting alongside genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression in the Rome Statute. Many of us have a problem with the, the current definition or the accepted draft idea of a definition, this idea of unlawful or wanton acts. So what this definition says is it will be easier to get ecocide laws in place if the definition says things that are already unlawful and that are extensive are ecocide. Many people would argue that if you said things that cause extensive harm are ecocide, would actually mean a whole bunch of new activities would fall under this idea of ecocide. And many people, including a lot of folks in the working group we have, feel that this conditioning, this parameter of it should be an uh, already an unlawful activity and then wanton destruction, et cetera, is actually quite limiting. But I think some of the folks who've been involved are looking at the practicalities of getting something into um, an accepted definition in the ICC. And obviously, these are issues that are up for discussion and are being discussed. So um, the international campaign, at the moment at least, through the work that Polly Higgin and Jojo Meta created and Jojo Meta and others in Stop Ecocide International continue to do, is advocate for this idea of adding ecocide to this Statute of Rome. The, the Rome Statute is a treaty. So it's a treaty amongst nation states that created the International Criminal Court. So this idea is if enough nation states agree to bring in ecocide into the statute, um, then it will become an international crime. Apparently, and I'm just checking my notes, they would need two thirds of member states, about 82 nation states would have to agree out of 123 uh, to bring ecocide in as an additional crime recognized. Um, and again, for those who might not be lawyers and don't know, um, this law would primarily target individuals. So a director of a company would no longer be protected by the corporate veil if they were found liable for their actions. Um, so the idea is to be a major deterrent for decision makers. I was asked to talk a little bit about ecocide and rights of nature. Um, a simple way to think about ecocide and rights of nature is ecocide is trying to put into criminal law this idea that large scale environmental harm is no go, not acceptable. It's a big bad thing. You would think that would be in place right now, but it's not for peacetime activities. Rights of nature is a little different because it's saying nature is not just an object. We want to recognize in civil law or in a legal system that nature has is a rights bearing entity. It has its own right uh, to exist, thrive and evolve. You could argue that both ideas have a preventative and a restorative impact, meaning you don't want to commit ecocide if that's a crime because you could get in big trouble, obviously. Um, you don't want to violate the rights of nature if nature has rights. Uh, at the same time, it should enable reparative or restorative actions. Um, and then finally, um, I know this is a potted overview of many key concepts that you could get into for days. Could ecocide law be created in Australia? Of course it could. Uh, like anything else, um, our laws are social constructs. They can be made, unmade, et cetera. Um, and I'm sure many in the room know this a lot better than me. I'm not a criminal lawyer, but responsibility for criminal law in Australia is divided between state and territory governments predominantly and the federal government. Um, and one of the papers that's been written by folks in our working group has suggested that a way to start would be to look at the code states. Western Australia, Queensland and Tasmania have criminal codes. And theoretically, you could try to introduce ecocide as a law into those codes. Um, it would probably have to open up an entire new family of crime in those codes because at the moment they're all very human centered, assault, homicide, sexual offenses, et cetera. Um, so, there's all these other nuances about if you were to put ecocide into the state or territory laws, what would that look like? Um, and finally, I'm looking forward to Anne's talk because as uh, Maureen suggested, everything we're talking about really is this construct inside Western law. Um, and in fact, what many of us in AILA um, and in other groups and obviously in Indigenous groups um, and communities are looking at is 
what if our legal system wasn't quite so structured like a Western legal system and actually was focused around whether you think of it as Indigenous first laws or earth-centered or earth laws structures, then it's a really different starting point and you may end up with a very different approach to what law looks like. So thank you for your time. And I hope that you could hear me. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Um, yes, we heard you uh, clear. Thank you very much. Let's pass down to on Kadigal Nation's lands and waters. I also want to acknowledge the country that we're standing on today because it is alive. It is a living, central thing. Um, why am I sitting here? I too am no lawyer. Um, but what I do do is write about lawful, awful laws. I'm an Indigenous leader at the front line of much unjust development in the Kimberley. I come from an amazing place called the Marawara. When I introduced myself, I said, Ngai yu i Marawara manan, which means I am a woman who belongs to the Fitzroy River, the Marawara. So in terms of not so much property rights, but in terms of due diligence and fiduciary duty, I have a moral obligation to protect our river's right, not only to live, but to flow. So the river is everything to us. It has created our identity. It has created our law. It has really become the river of life because it holds life, gives life. It is life. So rivers are amazing things. And so from this, we get what we call first law. Before white people came here, before the colonials and the settlers came, we had and still hold our first law, laws of the land. Indigenous people across the planet have not walked away from nature. We've stayed, we've been good to, uh, stewards and guardians, and we've you know, um, looked after under that custodianship, these last bastions of biodiversity that IUCN and IFBES write about. And so <laughs> these are the last frontiers in terms of if we are not just to have a climate change, but a climate chance because we're living with climate chaos and great uncertainty. So from my perspective, I come from, as though I'm not a lawyer, I come from a lawful place of um, seeing this world as a world that belongs to the we, not to me, a world of values, of ethics, of virtues, where we self-regulated our behaviour because we were focused on what Jan and Natalie and I are writing about, which is polycentric governance, bottom up not top-down toxic um, systems that become so contaminated that we forget that we are human beings. When we are born where I come from as an indigenous person, we are given what we call a judge or a totem. It's a, it can be a creature, an animal, a bird, a tree. That creature we are bonded to for life. And who could believe that an animal can teach us how to be good and virtuous human beings? So I come from a totally different worldview. And what we're saying is that, you know, I saw a map that was painted by an Italian map maker in 1687, and he did a painting of the Kimberley and it was called the Land of Peace. And so with settlement, what we've seen is a total disruption to that. What we continue to see, and I find the word quite strange, post-colonialism, because we're still within that framework. What we're talking about is not so much war, but war-like invasive unjust development, which continues to this day. So what we're talking about when I see ecocide, I see um, a conversation that what we're talking about is a crime against peace. And so this is very, very important in terms of these are the values, these are the ethics that we come from. We lived in this nation over 65,000 years because we came from that formation that we not only had place-based governance, but we also had regional governance. So in the Kimberley, we have something called the Wunan Law, which was a regional governance model because we looked after the commons for the common good, not just for human beings, but for a non-human family. So a totem for us is to teach us how to grow in ethics of care and love for place, how we see our non-human creatures as part of our family, that we have a duty of care and a moral obligation to ensure they reach their full potential, 
whether they're a tree, a mountain, a river, an animal. So we come from a total different worldview, which says that if we are to have peace, why aren't we not listening to the oldest and the ancient wisdom of Indigenous people, not just in this country, but across the globe? So what we're saying is that we are coming with this gift of wisdom as Indigenous people, not just in this nation, but across the world, to say that we really need to be thinking about what we're doing to country, with country. What we're creating is indeed not just ecocide, but cultural genocide. We are destroying amazing cultural diversity in this country still today. Um, it's difficult for me to not to be political because I'm born black. I'm born into a world that is really being confronted with the colonial paradigm of conflict, manipulation, divide and rule, all of these things. Those of you that know Paulo Freire will understand that what we're talking about is colonialism, globalism, neoliberalism. And what we're seeing is really no longer our nation states in charge. It's the multinational corporations. So when we look at genocide and ecocide, what we're talking about is politics and economics and how that plays out and infiltrates every system of thinking. As Indigenous people, we come from a world where we know we are dealing with complexity, so we need collective wisdom. If we are to right size the planet and give humanity a chance, then we might start to listen to what the voices of Indigenous people are saying, not just in this country, but globally. But what we're saying is that it's really a clash of values, a clash of ethics, a clash of virtues, how we have to modify the environment to see it as a resource. Somebody said to me, there are only two things in our world that we can control. One is time and two, our energy and how we use that wisely. So what we're seeing is a total disruption to Mother Earth. Mother Earth is a living system. And so what we are doing is destabilizing these systems with continuous extraction, and now we have climate chaos. So what we're saying as Indigenous people in, in this work that we're doing is that we cannot, when we talk about the river, I heard, I was so excited when I heard the Wanganui, Funganui, and I said to the other elders, do you realise that there's a river in New Zealand that has been granted personhood? And they looked at me as if I was from another planet. And when we're talking about our river, our sacred river, our living ancestral being, they said to me, he not a human being. The river is not a human being. And so much of the work that I've been writing about with scholars such as Michelle and different legal scholars across this nation is looking at transforming legal pluralism to recognise ancestral beings, that these are living systems. They have a right to do whatever they were purposely put on this planet to do. And so as we as Indigenous people, as I said globally, have a duty of care to govern for the greater good of all of us, to <clears throat> govern and look after our commons for the greater common good of all of us, not just for the multinational companies. So we must continue to do this work. We must continue to sort of lead and build on what Collie Higgins did. Um, what we say is that we call people to you. And I remember when I first met Polly, I was a little bit confused in terms of the work she was doing, but what I saw that she was preparing the rules of evidence of how you go into this sort of situation and build a body of evidence, which is multidisciplinary, multi-framed. And so what we're looking at now is, you know, we're at a critical moment in time, and I use this adage quite um, liberally, but people say to me, Oh, the Extinction Rebellion people say that if we are so stupid as human beings and we befall our own demise, Mother Earth will right-size herself. And I quickly say, yes, she will. She has that potential, but she will be lonely without the vibration of human beings upon her earth, upon her girth. So what we're dealing with is complexity. We need multiple forms of ways to look at the system. We need multiple worldviews. We need multiple ways of system thinking. We need all of this um, very, very urgently. Um, I come from a very crazy place called Western Australia, where you see that we're trying to rescind the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Bill. Um, and what we're saying with that is the place that I'm talking about, the Matawara, the Fitzroy River, it is national heritage listed, which means it belongs to every person sitting in this room. It is also the largest Aboriginal cultural heritage site in Western Australia. So we as Indigenous people at the front line of these unjust development projects are looking for ways to build this networking, to find the people who think 
and share our values and our ethics. We are publishing prolifically so that we have evidence should be going to that. But as I said, we come from a world of peace, but because of the invasive colonial development, we have to understand the strategies of war. So from that perspective, I work from left to right. I try, I have three masters, two PhDs, and the more I know, the more I do not know. And so we need to come together because we are in a moment in time where if we do not do that, we will not be able to right side the planet. Not only was I speaking about um, the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Bill, and my concern is that this is the largest, our river, our sacred river, which has made life, gives life, holds life, is the largest Aboriginal cultural heritage site in West Australia. It is so, so culturally diverse. There are nine nations there. Um, it's got a valley track that is just so magnificent. Here I am as an Indigenous woman, 65 years of age, and just in my estate, finding new things. So this is a really amazing place. And what we're doing is, as I said, looking at trying to deal with this from many, many perspectives, law, policy, um, reframing new economies around what I call the forever industries where we don't need to destroy anything. Global geoparks, biosphere reserves. I had a call the other day in regards to, oh, Anne, would you like to build a living water museum, UNESCO? I said, don't worry about it, we've already got it. It's called the Matawara, the Fitzroy River. The valley tracks are so diverse, the cultures are so diverse, that's got a tick and it's on its way to becoming recognised as a living water museum. But we're pushing the boundaries around ancestral personhood. But this is not just one thing. As Indigenous people, we do not separate land, water, people or nature. Remember I said we did not walk away from nature? We are holding on to it with very desperate um, groups because we know that this is the last bastion to your survival. So what we want as Indigenous people is to spotlight these unjust developments, come together because today as Indigenous people, we don't want to just govern for Indigenous people. We need to govern for the greater good of everyone who lives in our region. So our worldview is very, very inclusive. Despite what's happened to us, we come with love and peace in our heart to say that we need to, what we call, wake up the snake. How do you wake up the consciousness of the people to bring the people with you? Because it's the people that are going to transform these failed systems. So from that perspective, what we're saying is that we hold on to peace, but all we are seeing is warlike, invasive, unjust development, which not just impacts on us and our non-human kin, but it impacts on the well-being of everyone who lives around us. So I come from a world where everything I know and is very, very beautiful is being destroyed at an extremely rapid rate. It's difficult for me to not be political because I am a woman of colour. I am at the front line. I am educated. I've been through your systems. I understand how they work and do not work. And what I'm saying with the people that we're working with is that we're in a moment in time where we must build a coalition of hope. We must give our young people that dream that they can continue to dream that they will inherit under their due inheritance their right to inherit a world that is beautiful. And so I have a dream that you will all reach your full potential. We are working very, very hard um, with amazing people like Michelle and all of the different legal scholars across this side of the country. About two weeks ago, we just submitted with Michelle and several other people a book that's gone to Springer, and it's called A Declaration of Peace for Indigenous Australian people for nature and for earth laws. So that, that's a forthcoming title, um, let alone the work that I've been doing with Mr. Shan Turnbull over there. Indigenous people are coming with this gift saying, wake up, wake up the snake, wake up your consciousness. How do we do this together? So that I will not be like David Suzuki, bending down to pick up his grandchild and weeping profusely, wondering what sort of world he has brought his grandchildren into. I am working very, very hard to build this coalition of hope if I am still dreaming that the young people of this country and of this world will inherit a world that they have as their due inheritance. Thank you. So hopefully that um, inspired Thoughts and comments, and uh, you might have questions. Um, 
what we I set up in the sort of the early things, so sort of my five sort of groups of questions. One was trying to work out what is the conduct that we say uh, constitutes come to crime later, but constitutes ecocide. And so we've had four different perspectives uh, overlapping, but you can see they're identifying different conduct. And for the uh, for the law, we're going to define a crime. We have to settle on what is that conduct. Now we saw. I read you the the definition of the international um, expert panel um, for the legal definition of ecocide. You can see, and as Michelle uh, identified, some flaws in that definition. One of which was the one about unlawful. It seems rather strange, doesn't it? We're going to create a new crime. But we, as a definition, an element of that crime, you've committed another crime. Well, why do we need a new crime? If we've, if we've Let's just prosecute them for the first crime. So that sort of, you can see already a flaw there. But we need to go back, and with the discussions we've just had with the four speakers, to say, ask ourselves, why are we doing this? What's the purpose of this? And our instinctive answer is that the conduct is so morally reprehensible that it ought to attract a criminal sanction. That's why we make any crime. Not all breaches of the law are crimes. You go and look at the statute books and you'll say there may be an obligation on people to do or to not do something. But if they breach it, it doesn't always end up being a crime. We say that certain conduct, certain breaches of the law, cross a line of moral um, uh, culpability that we say it ought to be a crime. So that's what we're asking is, what is this crime? What is this conduct, rather? against the environment that becomes so morally reprehensible. Once we understand that, we can define it and we can come up with it. So each of the speakers found various things as to what they say is unacceptable. And then that should be introduced into that definition. That flows in morally reprehensible that it's going to be a crime, we can then go into the, well, who is the victims of the crime? And we, um, particularly Rachel was looking at that, but we were trying to say who it is, but also um, Professor Polini saying the river itself and its constituent biotic and indeed abiotic community are victims. So we need to recognize that because we can't begin to fashion the sanctions until we understand the victims. Because there are many purposes of sentencing for crime. They include that of denunciation, retribution, crimes are morally wrong conduct, and it is morally right to punish it. So that's one purpose of sentencing. So a Sanction should reflect that. But there is also the restorative and reparation purposes. This looks to the victims and says, we need to heal the victims of the crime. And so there ought to be a sanction imposed on the perpetrator of the crime that they do make reparation and restoration. And so, but to do that, we have to understand the victims. You can't make reparation or restoration uh, to a victim unless you know who the victims are. So that becomes really important to understand that. So you can see that this concept of ecocide, we have it, all of us have it in saying that sounds like a good thing. But the devil's in the detail. We have to actually start saying, what is it we are trying to do? That will frame what we say are the elements of the crime, but then we have to say, and who is it being done for? Who are the victims? And therefore, what are the sanctions? And unfortunately, 
if I look at these international uh, criminal um, or well, international crimes at the moment, I think too much energy is focused on making the crime and not enough to say, what are we going to do about the crime? And I think a lot more effort needs to be done if we're going to do ecocide in actually coming up with what are the sanctions for when this terrible, because we've decided it is morally reprehensible, this terrible crime has been committed. <laughs> so that's just sort of bringing together some of the, um, the points. Can I open the floor up to uh, anyone who would like to um, make a, uh, ask a question? Uh, you've got a great panel here who can uh, help. Um, and if you could just introduce yourself, just say who it is, uh, who is asking the, the question, or if you want to make a comment. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the panel. It was amazing. Um, I'm Alexander Buck. I'm a um, wilderness defender. I work for the Wilderness Society, environmental organization, and I also studied law at uh, Melbourne Uni. Um, my question to the panel, well, first, a little comment that, um, like, to, I think, Rachel, sorry, the names, I got a bit late because I was working, but um, that, like, about um, uh, skepticism, and uh, of the like changes I'm like let's not lose hope you know like environmental law in general is like 40 years old in Australia the Commonwealth versus Tasmania case is only 40 years old celebrated the anniversary like in July so like most of us weren't even born when environmental law was first established in Australia so like there's a lot of work to be done but you know like let's be positive and work together for peace um my question is like what are because the most the closest thing that we have to ecocide at the moment is the general environmental duty um, that you ought to minimize harm to the environment and human health as far as reasonably practicable. So if anybody has any insight on perhaps the points of junction and um, like yeah, any like insights that may be drawn from general environmental duty principles into ecocide. Thank you. Do you want to speak? Sorry, did someone talk to me? Yeah, I, I just said, would you like to um, start answering that question and before I go to the others? Yeah, thank you. I, I was just um, pondering that question and look, I don't practice day to day as an environmental lawyer. I haven't done so for a couple of decades. But my first response is many of the acts in place in, for example, Australian law at the state or federal level impose a general duty on people to care for the environment and then go forth and articulate things you cannot do or things you need a license for. But when articulating that duty, it doesn't correspond to ecocide level um, damage, and nor, nor. And Mary Graham, who's an Indigenous elder, a dear friend of mine, we we look at this a lot. The idea that Western society seems much more comfortable in explicit rights or explicit crime and punishment, rather than really understanding what a duty, responsibility, or obligation looks like. Um, so. I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear what Judge Preston, Rachel and other lawyers might say about this, but I don't feel that the current duties that are theoretically imposed on everyone from environmental law are in any way close to what Ecoside's trying to do, which is actually pinpoint human beings who are responsible for major dramatic environmental harm. But that might be a simplistic notion. So, yeah, turn back to you guys and girls. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on, on the topic of hope, it's it's not about not having hope. It's about understanding the international criminal law specifically is not coming to save us. I suppose I share some of the concern just expressed by Judge Preston that ecocide can soak up a lot of political and activist energy and maybe limited in its 
actual impacts. Whereas, you know, as our other panelists have said, we already had an intrinsic understanding of how to live uh, peacefully on this earth. And perhaps a kind of Western construct like criminal law is not the most appropriate sucking our energy. That's that's the that's where the cynicism comes from, rather than believing that we're all, all doomed. Although I do also think that. <laughs> um, on what environmental law offers, I suppose ecocide is a response to to its failings, isn't it? That you know the requirements that exist within environmental law, even things like precautionary duties, have so far failed to prevent large scale legal destruction of the environment. And I think that's one of the limitations, again, that's been flagged here is when we focus on ecocide as something that's illegal, it's so narrow because so much of the destruction of the environment is waved through by law. And in fact, you know, the rights of nature movement that sparked in the US was prompted by a realization that environmental law does most of the work of managing environmentalists rather than environmental destruction. Well, one thing I would say is that I think there's place for a conversation about um, broadening intent that might be helpful in terms of dialogue with environmental law, because as it stands, international criminal law, criminal law focuses on crimes of intent or at most recklessness, whereas a lot of environmental harm is caused by negligence or disregard. Um, so we might want to think about that might be something. Um, I'll stop there, would, would, would either of you like to speak? Oh, yeah. to I, I guess just to add on to um, what you were saying, Dr. Killian, I, I mean, I completely agree that, you know, the precautionary principle was enshrined in law decades ago, but it hasn't really materialized into something that prevents environmental harm. And I see the same, for me, the critique of ecocide laws is the same. It is punishment for something um, you know, incredibly harmful that you have done? And will that threat of that punishment actually prevent that harm? For me, that's what we need to look at. Um, but I'm with you, Rachel, a little bit. Like, I, I'm, I'm hopeful and, you know, I keep fighting till my last breath, um, like Anne, um, to, to keep that hope alive and, and to change things. But when I look at what's happening around me in the Australian Parliament, for instance, when governments are introducing things like the nature repair market bills, um, which is what you said, like it's totally the politics of economics, right? Like nature and market, like how do you put those two um, in the one sentence? Uh, and when we're looking at offsets for destroying nature, like it doesn't matter how much you offset at the end of the day, one piece of nature is destroyed anyway, right? Um, so, so that's kind of what is the challenge that we have. I was just in the in the Grove of Giants in the Southern Forest in Tasmania uh, with the incredible Bob Brown. And when you look at those giants, you you just you cannot replace them, no matter how much reparations you give. Um, I don't know if any of you have visited. If you haven't, you should go to Ruman Forest and go and visit this 500-year-old tree, which is called um, the Old Spotty. It's a 500-year-old uh, spotted gum. And you stand there and you look at it and you hug it. And, you know, that's life. That is actually life. And, you know, I was reminded by someone when I was there a um, couple of months ago that this tree has been here 250 years before Captain Cook arrived um, on these shores. I mean, you can just imagine the life that is in there. So we have to prevent the destruction of that. Um, and, and I feel that the, the stronger, probably way of looking at it is the um, rights of nature. Um, like the person quote that you said of the river in um, New Zealand, because I think what that does is it actually, you know, kind of stops you. The river has the right to flow in a certain direction. And that would stop you from changing the flow of that river. Um, so I think that's kind of where we need to go. It is prevention. Um, once it's done, it's done. And, you know, I don't know. I, I, we need stronger laws, of course, to be able to do, deal with that. But the punishment for that crime of ecocide has to be uh, preventative. 
Yeah, um, what we're talking about is, as I said earlier, clash of values. What we're talking about is focusing on the deficit, which is about punishment. One of the things I talked about in terms of the first law was that we created a moral obligation and a moral contract with each other to live a civil life, to be civil to each other. And that seems to have been sort of changed dramatically because, as I said, with polycentric governance, you self-regulated your behaviour. Whereas what we've got now is law that creates the regulations and the public policies that monitor this sort of thing. So it's, it's a total flip in terms of how we see and be in the world. So from our perspective, it was it is about that. One of the things that we're looking at is, as I said, we're dealing with complexity. We're talking about law here, but there's policy, there's science, there's all of these other disciplines that we need to bring into the frame as well. So one of the things that's happened, is, I'm not sure if you're aware, but at the beginning of the year, um, the former Minister for Indigenous Affairs, the traditional owners on the Ashburton River on the Mirandu, um, there was a case brought forward um, to the State Arbitration Tribunal. And I know that's not a court of law, but what we're showing is that we can push legal pluralism and be brave and push it out and extend. So the story was the traditional owners from this river were very, very concerned that Andrew Forrest wanted to build 10 weirs down the river in order to be able to extract water and ensure that he would remain profitable. And that went to the State Arbitration Tribunal. And there's an extensive body of um, knowledge that's come from that case, which is very, very interesting. I know it's not a legal precedence unless Andrew Forrest decides to challenge it, but the State Arbitration Tribunal said that they found in favour of the traditional owners because they believe with the body of evidence that they had that if he was to do that, it would kill the serpent being. So what you're seeing is that we need to be brave. We need to push the boundaries. We need to be looking at multiple forms of knowledge making, not just law. So how do we do this? Because if we're talking about the politics of economics where these unjust development projects are happening, we can't go to the poorest people on the land and say, don't go with that unjust development unless you have an alternative economic paradigm to shift people from poverty to wealth creation. Yeah, yeah. So it's very, very important that what we're saw, saying is that this is just one stream of a discipline. We live in a pluriverse, not a universe. We need to see the world in multiple ways and we need to bring all of these things. We need to be brave and we need to bring in legal philosophy in terms of interpreting legal pluralism to see and be in the world a different way. So as I said earlier, I think that when we start to look at punishment, we're looking down a deficit model. We need to be looking at how do we come together, human to human, non-human to human, and start to look at what is this pluriverse all about and do we have the opportunity to reach our full potential and let Mother Earth right size itself and give humanity a climate chance? So just one thing to, to add about the way we are trying to talk about our crime here, and it, it does have a punishment component. I mean, we we criminalise conduct which we say is morally wrong, and we say the punishment for that is morally right. But there, the punishment for both the creation of the crime as a deterrent effect, because people do not want to commit a crime which society has said is morally wrong. So that's it does have a deterrence effect. Not everyone goes and commits crimes. And so therefore that proof that there is a deterrent effect. But also when people do commit the crime, one of the principal purposes, particularly for environmental crimes of sentencing, is deterrence. And so the, the severity and the type of punishment that is selected will be informed by that purpose of sentencing of deterrence. That's not only individual deterrence, it's general deterrence to deter others. So that's why I say we need to give um, you know, a great deal of thought as to what is the sanctions, because that those sanctions will determine the deterrence level uh, and whether it acts. And that then, what does deterrence do? Prevention. Okay. That's what causes the prevention. So 
although we think of crime as being an after the fact punishment, um, crime is after the fact punishment, but it actually has a preventative effect. Both the encapsulation of the conduct as a crime, the publicization of that, together with the punishment for the crime does have this deterrence effect and therefore, hopefully, will prevent the very conduct that has been criminalised as eco smoking. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's Pete. Um, uh, and uh, I'm mainly involved in um, disability uh, rights advocacy and uh, sustainable transport stuff in terms of um, the environment. And I'm also involved in um, uh, founding um, artists for climate action. Um, I guess, you know, having done quite a bit of um, environmental philosophy, um, surely given the uh, the um, ominous um, state of uh, climate, um, anthropogenic climate um, uh, crisis that we're, we're now um, up to our next scene, um, that there is a, um, a superrogatory ethical moral uh, obligation incumbent upon uh, our political representatives in a democratic society, and I guess on each and every one of us as um, as uh, citizens of um, this um, beautiful uh, ecosystem, this planet that we live on. Um, one one idea came to mind from uh, you know these discussions about trying to um, uh, impose criminal uh, sanctions, etc. Uh, on perpetrators of, of eco side, um, the uh, phenomenon of fish death in relation to um, you know, uh, rivers of life, um, surely there might be an opportunity there to actually use criminal uh, law tools to try and uh, ascertain if there's any kind of uh, causal link uh, in terms of eutrophication of um, water systems and the, the perhaps. Uh, reckless use of uh, agricultural or industrial chemicals, uh, uh, industrial pollution, that kind of thing. Um, uh, the question though would be whether um, the, the law is at such a developed stage uh, on this nascent um, phenomenon um, that it would really be able to prosecute things um, very heavily. Um, if, if that wasn't the case, um, then maybe as citizens, we should be lobbying our parliamentarians to impose some um, uh, very heavy um, boycotts on uh, any kind of economic players and stakeholders who uh, are direct or indirect perpetrators of, of fish death and uh, eutrophication, pollution of, of water systems. Just a thought. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Adlan. Uh, I'm a visiting a scholar from Iran, and it's about two years I'm working on the rights of nature as a part of my research, PhD thesis. And uh, as a part of my research, I work on the eco side and its relevance to the rights of nature. Uh, I think uh, it has two aspects when we are talking about uh, ecocide as an international crime, which means we, we are going to give jurisdiction to the ICC to persecute some people to be accused of the ecocide as a new crime. I'm wondering that how it can influence on the activities of the states and non-state actors uh, or exploitation, pollution, and use of global commons, which are out of the national jurisdiction. And uh, another question is that what we are going to do with a big obstacle in international law called the principle of sovereignty or natural resources? 
and about Australia. Uh, I have a question that if the process of including ecocide at national level be successful, does it have any influence in backburns, which is really intentional and we don't have any problem, I think, with mental elements of this fraud. And as a comment, I believe that if we recognize ecocide, indirectly, we are giving legal personality to a new victim, which is really silent, and it's nature. But what is nature? And in the process of ecocide, maybe it brings a challenge that some parts of nature be excluded, which don't have economic value for humans because law is a human phenomenon. Thank you. I apologize. I couldn't hear all the question uh, very clearly. Uh, perhaps you guys could start. And if I have anything um, that jumps into my mind, I'll share. Thank you. Um, I think those are incredible questions. Um, it's really clear that you are able to kind of dive deep through your PhD studies into the real kind of like nitty gritty problems that this crime is going to have. So I really respect that. How do we manage state sovereignty is going to be a huge question. I suppose what will be interesting to see is how that maps onto an individual accountability mechanism in terms of are you imagining that as a as a defense uh, like how is it that you imagine that playing out the role of state sovereignty I, I would be intrigued to hear more I think one of the limitations of the ICC is also is, I suppose it's focused on individual uh, criminal liability and I think that came through in the panel as well do we need to be thinking about corporations but then how will that map on to the other legal frameworks that enable corporate behavior at an international level I think I don't have an answer I guess I'm just like be pushing how important those questions are because I think you're really getting into how will this actually work in practice but what I, I, what I have been thinking a lot about is how we define victimhood because I think you're right is there a risk that we will be drawn to the easier ones? Like um, a river has been, you know, has occupied this particular place in rights of nature movements, I guess in part because it's like kind of discernible. Um, it hosts a variety of other species, you know, it holds particular cultural values. So it's easy to be like, oh, I could see that the river is victim of the site and it, it would be represented. But what if it's... um you know, the atmosphere or like, I don't know, something that's less palatable to our human sensibilities. How do we then define it? I don't have answers to that either, but I thought, Libby and I have been thinking about this lately, like what is it we actually want in terms of defining a victim? And it, it might be that the stop ecocide definition, while, while flawed in some ways, offers an inclusive framing that when you combined with the idea that it needs to have experienced direct harm as a result of the crime might give us enough to work with. Um, so I'm not sure, but I, I think, yeah, these are all like really interesting questions as to how a crime that is environmental sits alongside environmental law, but also different ideas of sovereignty and natural resource allocations. And just one more thing on that point is that also has the potential to play out in extremely racist ways in terms of who ends up being in the dock and who is able to use their resources in particular ways. Yeah. Sorry, that was a complete callback, but I really appreciate your question. <laughs> <laughs> no one else wanted to speak. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> well, um, I guess because it is the last question, uh, uh, probably I think Rachel, you've answered the que question much better than me. But I do want to say that, I mean, we are still working within this system, which hasn't worked for a very long time for nature. So I guess that's kind of my biggest um, critique of you know what we're doing in terms of ecocide uh, because for me I think the, the system needs to be changed we you know for me this new wave of environmentalism that needs to happen has to be anti-colonial um, it has to be um, you know global feminist and it has to be pretty radical 
um, because we have the potential, we have the potential, the planet saving, um, you know, life making potential. We have that. We need to prize, you know, the power away from corporations and capture governments if we want to do that. Um, and I just want to end with this, um, you know, quote from one of my favorite authors, which is Arundhati Roy, who has given a lot of thought um, to, you know, um, society and environment, how that interacts. And a couple of years ago, she wrote and said, we can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And for me, that's what it is. We have got to imagine a different world and we have got to fight for it. And now is the best opportunity and time to fight for it because we cannot go on. I think we've all realized that we cannot go on as we have. Um, and so yes, use all the tools, but I think we need to think about different tools which look at the world in a different way, which look at the world the way indigenous people have lived in this country for 65 years. Um, in terms of my closing comments, I wanna go back to the rights of nature. There would not be the laws for the rights of nature without indigenous people, First Nations people at the front line, defending the things that they love around them. So from that perspective, what we're saying is that this book that's coming out at the moment that we've done with Michelle and several of others of our colleagues, Mary Graham, Tyson Young, Porter, what we're saying is that we, in terms of getting this transformation, we need to start somewhere. And so this paper, this book that we're just about ready to publish, it's gone, it's in press, it's forthcoming, is really looking at how do we open up the dialogue? How do we open up and bring in a collective worldview of seeing and reframing the world in which we want to dream and keep dreaming about. So from that perspective, this book will be about how do we fuse nature's law with Earth's law, which is first law. What is the law of this land from the beginning of time that taught us how to be civil and good and decent human beings? Where is that in legal philosophy? How is that coming in to inform legal pluralism? So it's, you know, being brave, finding those like-minded people out there who want to transform systems, but bringing up this ancient Indigenous wisdom, which is so relevant for modernity today. Remember I said we come from a pluriverse, not a universe, and so we need multiple ways to see and be in the world. And if we are not bringing in Indigenous wisdom from across the globe, as I said, we will not be able to right-size the planet. This is a clash of values, of ethics, of virtues, and the first law stories that come from this land always taught us to come from a strength-based perspective. We did have punishment. People were punished. And as Judge said, it taught us how to look at different things. But it was not all warlike. We could not have sustained ourselves on this country if we had performed with that sort of behaviour. So what we're saying is that we dream. We continue to dream. We push the boundaries. We influence legal philosophy, legal pluralism. We have a word in my language which gives me hope. It's called Pugaragara. It's how we look at the past in the present to design the future. So we can only do this with the revolution of new and young minds, challenging systems, being brave, pushing the boundaries and saying, we all need to stand together because humanity and Mother Earth depends on it. So thank you for the time. Thank you for inviting me. I think there's really interesting stuff coming out. We have to be brave. We have to put these things out there. We need to challenge the system because we can't just look at law on its own. As I said when I started, this is about the politics of economics. We should not be destroyed so that we can be a case study of how we can do things differently. So this is a moment in time where there are like-minded people. I truly believe we are building a coalition of hope. We need these multiple knowledges, but we need most importantly to frame this from the worldview of Indigenous First Nations and First People, and we can all have a climate chance. Thank you. Well, that um, uh, audacity of hope, uh, we will uh, conclude the, uh, the discussion. So thank you very much for your participation, and thank you uh, to all of our uh, panelists. Uh, we can give all around, including Michelle. Um,